It's amazing what you can achieve with, uh, with Twitter. It's like, do you want to do this gig? Uh, is it a Thursday? Uh, yeah. Because uh, this is my busiest teaching term. I'm teaching three classes at the moment. But, I can, uh, uh, but Thursdays have no lectures, so I can uh, sneak off and you know, do nine o'clock talks. Whereas normally at my institution, the timetable people are my mates, and they understand that expecting me to show up at nine in the morning just isn't going to work. Uh, so this is a, I'm in a different time zone. I might have a bit of jet lag. Uh, anyway, uh, th this talk is based on a homework that I set my fourth years. Uh, so I thought I'd just actually start by, by running a program that's actually written in Agda. And so, like, this is an honest-to-goodness terminal window. And, uh, and I'm going to you know, issue a, a command line request to run a program. And then my program will run in this terminal window. Basically, I ask my students if they would write a simple window manager that runs using ANSI escape codes in a perfectly ordinary terminal window. And it's got to be, it's got to have at least two windows and you've got to be able to, to move them around. And then you've got to be able to sort of toggle a window and maybe you know, resize them a bit. And, and then toggle back. Oh, and it's got to cope with somebody kind of resizing the, that's always fun while it happens. Um, and uh, uh, and the, the, the code to do this is, uh, is not particularly, um, well, it's not particularly long. Whether it's particularly simple is another, is a matter of opinion. Uh, but, uh, but what's going on? Uh, well, I'll tell you what's going on if I can only find my, uh, what's going on at Space Monads. Uh, so this is an honest to goodness uh, Agda buffer, and so by way of starting a conversation, how's the font size, not the figlet font size, the, the little one? Do I need to make that bigger? Yes, I thought I might. I thought I'd be good to... Uh, so let's change the font. It's currently 18. It's always happened to you plug, plug into an HDMI. How's that? Mo Sorry? Oh, mm. Yeah, that happened earlier. I think let's try turning it off and on again, like you do. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing. Why should changing the font size mess the display up? Yeah. Insufficient monads. No, yeah, let's see. Is it, uh... and then, of course, you're going to tell me it's too small, and we'll go through this rigmarole again. Actually, that's not what's going to happen. Ah, it's, what happens? Right, if I change the font size in the other window, uh, then I will have to go through the same rig roll again. Uh, font for compilation mode, that's going to be important. That's 24 as well. Am I getting away with that? Okay. And I've got mirrored displays, and my cheat sheet is still hiding behind the other window. Um, Right, so of course, I, I, my original plan was to like, walk you through the homework that I set my students. And then uh, yesterday, I decided to rewrite it completely. Uh, so, uh, uh, so I finished it at about um, half past seven this morning, and, and then I wrote my slides. Um, but uh, that's more preparation than my undergrads ever get. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, okay. Uh, of course, I've forgotten what I was going to say, so I always leave leave myself some some notes. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, right. Uh, it, it's basically, you know, one of the the most marvelously useful facts that uh, that the perimeter of some sort of area scales much more gracefully than the area itself, right? So take a, a, a circle. If you scale up the circle, 
the, the, the circumference of the circle will grow linearly, while the area enclosed uh, in, uh, in the circumference grows quadratically. And this has been absolutely vital to human progress for longer than anyone can remember. Because basically, basically, right, back in the hunter-gatherer days, it all got so much simpler when somebody invented the fence. <laughs> I mean, you know, the macho hunter-gatherer people thought fences were kind of cheating. And, you know, they would point out that there were tasty animals outside the fence, and it was sometimes necessary to go and find them. But, you know, keeping, keeping you know, lots of handy animals that, that, that could be, you know, managed inside the fence uh, made, you know, so much more production possible. And then all you had to do was maintain the fence. And if you wanted, like, a bigger area, you could, uh, you could, uh, you know, you could quadruple your area for only twice as much fence. So the message is, if you want to create a workable space, manage its boundary. I could make some tart remarks about taking back control of our borders, but I'm... Uh, <laughs> But I'm Irish, and they promised us that they wouldn't. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> right. Uh, what's all this got to do with dependent types and what's going on anyway? Well, let's sort of have a, a dependent types uh, 101. This, uh, the, I'm, I'm not loading any libraries in this file, so you're pretty much seeing everything. Uh, so I'm going to sort of kick off with a typical example, which I'm actually going to use seriously. Uh, so I start by saying what the natural numbers are uh, in, in kind of re reassuringly efficient unary and, uh, and how to add them up. And then uh, here's uh, the, the, the typical example of numbers being used to control precisely uh, the length of lists. We call length indexed lists vectors, and you can see that there's an empty list called nil, which is known to have length zero, and a cons constructor, which increments the length of the list. Uh, and then we can, we can try to, to write some programs. Let's, let's have a bit of that. Uh, so we might, for example, want to concatenate vectors, which should mean that we should add their length. So, so it, it's too early in the morning to do that sort of thing. So I'm just going to ask Agda to do it. And because there aren't very many programs of that type, it just guesses the right one. Um, uh, it's not a very pretty program, but it's saved me writing it. Clearly does the right thing. Uh, and uh, then. Uh, what else might we want to do? Well, if we have like one element of x and we want to make a vector of exactly n elements of x, well, there's only one thing we can do really, which is just to copy the element we've got the right number of times. So there only is one program of that type. So again, I'm just too lazy to write it. And, um, and then another thing we might like to do, just by way of example, this is sort of a zippy example. Here we're using the length invariant seriously. We've got a vector of functions from s to t. There are n of them. And we've got exactly n elements of s to feed to those functions. So we should be able to pair them off and, and produce a vector of n elements of t. And again, it's just such a, a boring thing to do. That, uh, that Agda does it for me. Um, so uh, yeah, that's sort of, uh, the people sometimes have this strange idea that typed programming is, if you'll pardon the metaphor, uh, a challenge rather like pissing over a wall into a bucket. And um, if you, uh, you know, and the, the, then the sort of impression is that 
uh, you know, if you make the types more complicated and more precise, then the, the, the wall gets taller and the bucket gets further away. Uh, but that's, um, that's not what's going on at all. Um, if, you're, if you're making a more precise down payment uh, in, when you write the type of a program, then there are fewer choices that you have to make to refine that type to get a program. So the work moves to designing the type. And once you've got the type, then cranking out the program that, that turns that into a bunch of algorithmic choices is much less work than it was before. Of course, designing the type is non-trivial. Um, you know, so that's why, uh, that's why I only, uh, I've written all the types in my file. And, and I'm just going to write programs. Uh, uh, but yeah, so sometimes that's, that's where the effort goes. It's moved to a different place. It's moved to a higher level place. And that's a win. Uh, you know, lots of people try and flog you type inference. Um, but I, 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 type inference is so last century. Uh, the, um, the right thing to do is to write the types down and then get as much mechanical assistance generating the programs as possible. Anyway. Uh, what am I going to use vectors for? Uh, I'm going to use them at least a little bit as matrices. So I'm going to, so if I give, define this type of, of rectangles, rectangular dimensions, width and height, then I can say what uh, a matrix of rows is by saying it's, it's height many vectors of width, uh, of the given width. OK, so that, that type will come back. And you can see it's very easy. We know that all our rows are the same length. It's not like a list of lists in Haskell or something like that. Uh, so these things behave nicely. And it's possible we can kind of fit them together in nice ways. So this is one tool we've got to help us control uh, the use of two-dimensional space, is to actually manage the, the size of, of things. OK, I've got no idea what's on the next slide. Uh, oh, yes. Hmm. Um, yeah, so here's, here's some other stuff. So we've seen uh, vectors indexed by NAT, and we've matrices indexed by rectangles or, or pairs of NATs. Now, let's, let's figure out uh, just how to work in the indexed world in general. So we're going to see a lot of these things Things that live in something arrow set, I arrow set, where I you can think of as index. And, and um, so what is one of these things? Well, it's, it describes what it is to fit with I. So we've got, for example, our vectors had to fit with their length. So we've got some notion of data that has to fit with some information that describes some important property of it. And then it's reasonable to consider, if we've got two such notions for the same, no for the same kind of index, when, when do we have an index-respecting function? Right? If we have uh, an, so this funny arrow means, uh, yeah, it's one of my worst habits, actually. I, I routinely define infix binary operators, which take three arguments. Uh, I can't help it. Um, it's, <laughs> it's a component, and then I use them in a higher order way. Right, so, um, so this S funny arrow T is the indexed set of functions which, uh, for a given I, may turn S's that fit with I into T's that fit with I. And then here's how I, uh, I use that thing. I uh, have this set of square brackets which wraps up an indexed set uh, as a set, just saying, well, I have one of these for every index. And that means I can write down a notion of arrow between indexed sets, uh, which says, so at one of these square brackets, x funny arrow y, means I can always turn x's into y's, preserving the index. OK, so let's just see that. If I normalize arrow, I don't know how to make the mini buffer font bigger. Then 
then the type of, of one of these things in boxes is for all i that will use this, curly braces mean this is usually kept implicit, but it's a universal quantifier. For all i, we can turn an xi into a yi. So we've established that we've got some notion of arrow, not between sets, but between indexed sets. So the obvious question to ask is, if you've got some notion of arrow, is, uh, is it a category, right? Do we've, have we got the usual bits and pieces to make it, I mean, this may not be, it's obvious, it's the obvious question to ask if you, if your office is next door to Neil Ghani. Um, all right. So, uh, do we have an identity arrow that gets us from X to X? Well, actually, perfectly ordinary identity function is polymorphic enough to fit in that hole. And if we have an F that gets us from Y to Z and a G that gets us from X to Y, can we compose them? Well, yeah, perfectly ordinary function composition. Uh, we'll plug those things together just fine. So we've got, so ordinary identity in composition will work for these index respecting functions, and composition is associative and absorbs identity. Same as usual. So we've established that for not our usual notion of arrow, we've got our usual stuff. So that's, that's good. What else do we have? Well, we've got some notion of what it is to be a, a functor between different uh, notions of indexed set. And that, so F maps I indexed sets to J indexed sets. So if we have an I-respecting function from A to B, we should be able to construct a J-respecting function from F of A to F of B. That's, um, so that's just, the, that's what would make such a transformer uh, a functor. And you note that I and J need not be the same thing. Um, so for example, um, Vectors are, are numerically indexed, uh, but you can treat their elements as just being indexed by the unit type. And you get a perfectly sensible functor that says, if we have a map from elements to elements, we have a length-preserving map from vectors to vectors. Um, but if we've scaled as far as functors, that's base camp, then let's then let's shoot for, uh, let's shoot for monads. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I wonder kind of what sort of weirdness is going to, to result from that. Uh, okay, so uh, what do we have to give to make some sort of S? So now I've chosen W. I think I, in my head W stands for world here. Uh, we're indexing by some notion of how the world is. And we've got something that maps W indexed sets to W indexed sets. And when is it a monad? Well, if we know what the arrows are, then we can write down what the usual stuff has to be. OK, I have, I've written extend. That's flip bind, if you're a Haskeller, rather than bind itself. But you have to provide two things. You have to provide something that takes P to F of P, and if you have a P to F of Q, then uh, you need to be able to jack that up to an F of P to F of Q. It's the same types that you might be familiar with from, from Haskell. It's just, I mean, the same idea, it's just that we're doing it with a different kind of arrow in a different situation, but we're doing exactly the same thing. And what on earth does any of this mean? Isn't it all kind of scarily abstract? Well, I'll tell you what happened. Uh, I, I was sort of staring at this definition the first time I wrote it when, uh, when Peter Hancock uh, walked into my office. Um, Peter Hancock, he did the first implementation of type theory in, in 1970, and he also wrote VMS. Uh, it's amazing how someone with such terrible teeth can achieve so much. Uh, and, um, 
And uh, he, he walked in and he said, oh, whore logic. I thought, why did he say that? And then I realized that it was a perfectly sensible thing to say. Right, if you cross out uh, set and write prop, right, if you think of these things as properties of the world, right, what's one of those? It's a condition. And then what's one of these things? It somehow captures the idea that if P holds, there's some computation which can achieve Q. That's to say, to build something of this type is to write a program which can deliver post-condition Q whenever pre-condition P holds. That's to say, uh, you know, to say this program has that type is exactly to write down a whore triple. Goodness me, it was going to be scary 21st century category, and it's the 1970s. Right, so what does the type of retics tell you? It says, if the precondition holds, there is a strategy for achieving it. Right? You know, if the, that's to say, you can, you can satisfy a post-condition if it already holds, by doing nothing. That's to say, this thing, weird retics thing, is the thing you call skip. And then if you jack Claisley extension up to Claisley composition, then you get exactly the whore logic rule for semicolon. You know, if you have a program that can achieve uh, Q from P and another program that can achieve R from Q, then putting a semicolon between them gives you the program that achieves R from P. So, goodness me, monads on indexed sets, not weird. Just like how we think about programs at all. And it's kind of fun also. So there is a bind. One thing that's amusing about that I don't like the bind for this because its type isn't pretty. I have to break things apart. But you can see the idea is if starting from world W, we can achieve P somehow, and then in any world where P holds, we can get to Q, then we can get to Q from W. But you'll notice that this quantifier is at rank two. The caller of bind does not get to choose V. They have some V thrust upon them by the world. <laughs> right, all we've done is specify a post condition for, uh, for the first computation, that's P. And then the world is free to choose any state in which the post condition holds. And they can try and choose that to mess us up as much as possible. So we better make sure that the post condition says what we care about. Uh, and it's that freedom uh, to, uh, to let the world choose a state that satisfies P that means these are the right thing to model contingent interaction uh, with a hostile environment. Uh, because they actually model the fact that there are some things we don't control. If we write a weak precondition, we're saying, we, we only know this much, and then the world is free uh, to, to satisfy that. So this is a very useful notion. There is a notion of laws, but I'm going to skip over that, because they're the usual laws. I mean, they're just the category laws. Um, Let's think about what a space monad is. Uh, now that we know what a monad is. Well, the index in this case is going to be the perimeter of the space. I promised you we were going to manage the perimeter. So we're going to talk about things that fit with a perimeter, that fit into a perimeter. So what do we need to be able to do with our notion of perimeter, we need to be able to cut it up. So I explain, in general, what it is to be able to partition a perimeter. You have to be able to say, given a perimeter, what are the ways to cut it into pieces? So that's what this field of the record is. For a given perimeter P, there is a set of ways of cutting it up 
And then uh, once you've cut it up, like if you were cutting up a piece of paper or something, then you need to say uh, what pieces you've cut it up into and what their perimeters are. So that's the idea of, of how to cut things up. Uh, you, uh, you say what cuts are possible and what pieces you get. And you specify the pieces just by listing their perimeters. And then we get uh, a notion of, uh, we get a space monad, which is uh, you know, how to build, how to tile the interior of a perimeter with pieces built from this thing. So this X is a, a set of pieces with given perimeters. And they are the tiles that we are allowed to use to tile the interior uh, of our perimeter P. And there are two constructors. One says, if you happen to have a tile which fills the whole interior, then you can just stick it in there. You're done. The other strategy you have available to you, if you're trying to fill up perimeter P, is to choose a way to cut P up. And then you have to explain how you're going to tile all the pieces that you get from cutting it up. So this all thing, it's a predicate transformer. Uh, it says if we've got a set indexed over X, we can lift it to a set indexed over list x by saying, I would like one of these for each element in my list. So what I'm saying is, I would like an interior tiling for each of the pieces coming out of the cut. Right, so that in general is what uh, is a, you know, a way of talking about space with respect to its perimeter. And I realize it's all got a bit abstract and I need to pay attention to the time. So let's Let's, without further ado, uh, oh, I should actually, ah, no, not without further ado, I forgot this slide. We should actually implement the operations. So we can see that uh, the return is going to be uh, just the thing that plugs uh, a tile directly in. But then we need to build something which says, well, if we know uh, how to make x's into sort of tilings of y's, then we can make tilings of x's into tilings of y's, if you want to think of it like that. So what do we do? Uh, uh, we, uh, we just uh, get cracking. Is it going to get that one? Um, no. Uh, sometimes you could be too lazy. Uh, right, so that's my constructor for cutting things up. Uh, this should be called XIs. And then this. That should be P and P's. Those are the perimeters. This should be one XI, and this should be a bunch of it. Agda chooses terrible names. Um, Uh, that's the marvelous thing about it. I mean, there was only one thing that would type check, so why, you know, why keep a dog and bark yourself? Uh, so, um, right, so we can build, so what's going on? We're just uh, digging down through the structure, looking for uh, the tiles that it's made from, and then for every X tile, we know how to replace it with a Y interior that's exactly the right size to fit in the space where that tile was. So I'm hoping you've got a kind of reasonable spatial intuition what's going on. We're talking about replacing uh, you know, things that fit a perimeter by structures that fit the same perimeter. Right. It's time we had an actual example. Let's see how to cut up rectangles. Uh, so I'm saying that if we have a, a rectangle we might want to cut it in an, allow cutting it in an axis aligned way. So uh, we might want to cut a rectangle into a, a left to right uh, bunch of pieces. That's to say, we should be able to, 
split the width of the, record, of the rectangle into two components, which should add up to the original width. And uh, similarly, we should be able to cut a rectangle horizontally if we can think of two numbers, two heights, that add up to the original height. Does that seem like reasonable ways to cut up a rectangle? And then what size, what are the pieces we get? Well, for each cut, we get two pieces. And I hope you can see, I'm just, I'm just saying, the two pieces we get from cutting uh, into a left piece and a right, right piece have the original height, but the two smaller widths. And similarly, if you cut into a top and a bottom, then they have the original width, and the, um, uh, uh, but the new pair of heights. So that's just saying, look, here is one, one notion of perimeter, rectangles, one notion of cutting it up in an axis-aligned sort of way. Um, OK, so just instantiating space monad with that way of cutting things up, I can consider the problem of, uh, of how to, to tile the interior of a square. So, no, the, well, the interior of a rectangle that's 13 wide and 8 high. And the pieces I'm allowed to tile it with are squares. You can see here I've, I've, given, myself, I've given myself some grief. I've said square is the type of rectangular indexed things where the only things which exist are squares. Right? You can't make an element of square width height unless width and height are equal. So the question is, uh, can, we, can we tile uh, the interior of a 13 by 8 rectangle with squares? Well, let's see what we can do. If we make an LR cut, if I can only type. Well, let's, let's cut it into uh, 8 and 5. And then my proof that the things are equal is reflexivity. And then I have to give two pieces. And you can see I'm being asked for an 8 by 8 square and a 5 by 8 square, or a 5 by 8 rectangle interior. I haven't had enough coffee. So I can put a square there, and then I could keep going, of course, I'm glad I left myself that note. <laughs> Too far. Right, so here's, here's one I made earlier. Uh, and you can see I'm, uh, I'm busy cutting, uh, cutting up according to the Fibonacci series to make, uh, to make this, this tiling with an 8 by 8 square on the left. And then on the right, I've got a 5 by 5 square on the bottom then a 3 by 3, a 2 by 2, and a pair of 1s. Um, so, wouldn't type check if the pieces didn't fit. Right, so that's, to some extent, what's, what's going on here. Uh, I've got um, a bunch of rectangular regions, and I'm guaranteeing that they fit into the current viewport size. Uh, but how do I generate a bunch of text to splat out? I shall just comment that back out. Um, right. So to do that kind of rendering, I need to be able to paste things together. And uh, to do that, I need some extra apparatus, right? That here's... Here's what we're trying to achieve. Suppose we've got an interior of a, a rec, of a space made of X's, uh, and I want to glom that all together into one big X. Right? So uh, remember, these funny arrows have to preserve the, uh, the dimensions. So what I'm saying is I've got like a, a, a packing, an interior made of packing lots of X's together, 
and I want to smoosh the x's into one big x with the same size, uh, well then, what do I need to be able to do? For any way of cutting up space, I need to know that if I have x's for all the pieces, I can put them together to make one x with the original perimeter. And if I can do that, then I hope it seems reasonable that I can take uh, an interior made of x's and manufacture one big x. So let's, um, let's do that for, uh, for matrices. Right? So you might like, so if we actually, if our rectangular things are really matrices of maybe characters or something like that, then we ought to be able to actually glue these rectangles of characters together to make big rectangles of, of, of characters. Um, so, um, so what do we have to do? We have to be able to explain how, uh, for any way we can cut, how to take the pieces and put them together. So it's just as well we wrote all those uh, vector operations. I think this one's done with this thing. Uh, oh, no, there's no plus there. Yeah, that's that. And then I think this one's made with these things. Yeah, that'll do. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, it's the... Uh, the, the fact that the pieces are, have their sizes means that they only fit together in particular ways. Putting them together in ways that don't fit uh, uh, won't type check. So you can just say, well, you know, here's a bunch of stuff. Try and put the pieces together. And then basically, well, right, so this, this, this mechanism, by the way, is, uh, is a sort of byproduct of quick check. Um, so the people who were working on quick check at Chalmers uh, had to do all of this stuff to sort of generate terms uh, as, uh, as tests for, uh, for programs. And then what they decided to do was plug that into the type checker, right? So all it does is it generates kind of, uh, it generates systematically, it's actually small check rather than quick check, systematically bigger and bigger candidate terms that might go in the hole and then you get the first one that type checks. Uh, it's very, very cool. Um, OK. Uh, um, time is marching on. Um, I've got uh, one more thing which isn't terribly interactive, and then I'll try to be interactive. Um, but this is, uh, uh, this is the, key, uh, the key gadget. And I just want to point to, uh, to the types that come in and the types that go out. Let's, let's switch on the electricity. Oh, no, I've copied it wrong from my... That's time to cheat. <laughs> Here's one I made earlier. Right. What's this thing? This is the thing that lets you do those multiple layers, right? You can see I've got a front layer and a back layer. And each layer is a rectangle that fits the window. But some of the regions in each layer are transparent. So what I need to be able to do is to take two layers, which have some transparent regions, and flatten them into one layer so that you can see through the transparent things in the front layer to whatever is behind in the back layer. And that basically means whatever way the front layer is cut up, we need to be able to forcibly cut the back layer up that way too. So what's the equipment required to do that, uh, well, for a start, whatever time, what, so here, x is what's in the front layer, and y is, the x are the tiles in the front layer, and y's are the tiles in the back layer. So we say, well, we need certainly to be able to cut y's up. That means 
If we have a way of cutting up the perimeter, and we have a big Y that has the perimeter, we need to get Ys for all of the pieces that you get when you cut the perimeter up, for any way you want to cut it up. And similarly, you need to know that whenever you can cut Ys up, you can cut up interiors and get all the interior uh, interiors for all the pieces. Uh, that'll do it for us. Then we can build this operation, which I call mask. So what, what do we have to feed it? Well, we have to feed it a way of cutting Ys up. And then we're trying to achieve something which takes an interior full of Xs and an interior full of Ys and produces an interior full of Zs. And notice that this type says that the perimeter is being preserved all the way along. Right? So we know that the, these, these rectangles fit exactly. They're ready for superimposition. And the key thing you need to provide is, given a, a single X tile and an interior Y that has been cut to fit, you need to be able to produce a Z. Z, of course, could itself be an interior. Um, so... Uh, how do you do that? Well, you just, by recursion on the structure of the front layer and cutting the pieces of the back layer to fit. That's all that's going on. Um, there's, uh, there's some fun stuff, uh, which... Uh, so, the, the business of cutting up uh, one of these axis-aligned things is, is highly amusing. Right. Uh, so the crucial thing is, you know how you want to cut it up? Uh, but then you see it's been cut up differently. Um, right. So if, if you've got a, you know, if somebody hands you an interior that's cut here and you want it cut there, what do you do? Uh, well, you cut the piece that's on this side where you want to cut it. Um, so the crucial thing uh, is, is this thing. Um, if you know that you've got the same n split up as x plus x prime, but you can also split it up as y plus y prime, then you can compare the two places where you've split it. And there are three possibilities. Either you're dead lucky, and they match exactly. That never happens. Uh, uh, or you know that y is x plus some overlap, in which case x prime must be the same overlap plus y prime. Yeah? So if you're comparing cutting here with cutting here, then uh, you know, the region this side of this has to, can be cut here. Uh, that's all that's going on. And it's just a fancy version of the usual way you compare numbers. It's just a delivering. Uh, so you, can, you, know, you split it into 0 versus 0, 0 uh, versus a successor, successor versus zero, successor versus successor, make a recursive call, put the pieces back together again. Uh, so that, if you know how, you, how to compare the places where things were cut, then you can, uh, you can uh, build this cutting up technology, and that gives you the ability to do superimposition. And then all you need to do to get this thing uh, working nicely is remember which layer is in front uh, and then render each layer as either transparent or a matrix of, uh, of character blocks uh, and then uh, splat the whole thing down to one big matrix and then uh, when you render it in cursors you can almost watch the cursor move and it's extremely slow and unbearably flickery. 
so what you do instead is just remember which things change and have a slightly nicer masking logic where you remember for each sub-rectangle whether it's transparent or full of stuff and whether it has changed or not. And then you get the right flattening logic that tells you only how to redisplay what's changed. And then you run length encode your cursor movements on the way to the terminal. And you get something that's almost nice. Let's have it again. You see? Smooth as silk. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Okay, where am I going with all this? I can tell I should shut up. Um, uh, it's so small, this font, I can't find my slides. Right, <laughs> right. Uh, I'm not sure I wrote the conclusion. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so <laughs> um, right. I mean, that, that, so what, are, what, what do types... So I've shown you literally a use of dependent types uh, managing the way sort of geometric objects can be fitted into a perimeter. And that's a sort of rather visual metaphor for what, uh, for what types do in general. Types characterize the ways in which we want our components to fit. Uh, I mean, uh, a perimeter system, I mean, what, that's what types do. Types manage the perimeter, uh, and they create a structured space into which, inside which to construct uh, you know, well-managed things. And you've seen in the course of this talk uh, how, much, uh, how much agricultural machinery we have for the business of raising programs inside a well-built perimeter, you know, rather than the 20th century practice of running out into the wild with a spear and, you know, throwing it at some lump of lisp and hoping <laughs> that when you've dragged it back to the cave, you can figure out what type it has. Um, <laughs> um, um, so, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, types are some kind of, of uh, you know, <laughs> hmm, this, this might be a wildebeest. It's certainly dinner. Uh, so, you know, types as, as, as classification for wild things that we do after we've caught them, but before we eat them. Right. <laughs> In order to avoid that kind of was it something I ate experience. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, uh, you know, the, the, this this idea that they like types describe phenomena, types come out from stuff, is completely uh, you know the, the the wrong way to use types. Right? Types capture our requirements. We push them in, and because we're pushing them in, we can do. Uh, we can do structured, organized, uh, intensive agricultural raising of well-behaved, domesticated programs. <laughs> so, so it's time that we stopped being hunter-gatherers. Let's be farmers and invest in good fences. somebody is supposed to be saying, oh, yeah. <laughs> there are some questions I can see. What do the error messages look like? Uh, what error messages? <laughs> the, the type checker error messages. Uh, well, okay. So I, I asked what error messages in, uh, for, for two reasons, uh, uh, neither serious. Uh, I mean, uh, so on, on the one hand, uh, the... Uh, uh, the whole of the game is to, uh, is to navigate 
the space of unfinished programs that type check so far. Um, I mean, what, so when you fill in, when you fill in holes, um, each move you make, uh, you can only make moves that the type system uh, uh, will agree with, and indeed, you often make moves that the uh, type system suggests, and correspondingly, you encounter errors in that process uh, relatively rarely. Uh, there's, of course, something, to, something else to be said. Meanwhile, of course, uh, when you encounter errors in these situations, uh, they, um, uh, well, error messages are as good as the technology that has been invested into producing them, and the people who build these tools uh, don't often, I mean, Edwin and, and David has done a much better job of this than the, the Swedes have with Agda. It's, it's a class of, of, of activity that, um, uh, that Heinz Wolf, remember Heinz Wolf from Brunel? Big, you know, mad hair, bald on top, great egg race. Uh, he used to classify this sort of research as uh, uninteresting research into necessary equipment, or urine. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, and that's the trouble is that, you know, it, it's, really, uh, it's really necessary stuff, but, uh, uh, but people uh, don't invest time in it because it's not as much fun. It doesn't feel like really, you know, frontier, uh, frontier busting stuff. Um, of course, what you have instead of nasty error messages from the type checker is the realization when you're deep into some... Uh, hacking problem that you wrote the wrong type in the first place and that you actually need to think again what the specification of the problem was. You, effectively, you get specification errors in some form. And that's where the technology is completely missing. I mean, one of the things, so you, you, can, you see... Uh, you know, I'm there, I'm filling in holes, I'm getting the machine to help for me, I've figured out what the types are in advance because I've done this before, not my first rodeo, and all the time I'm in Banzai mode, right? The, uh, you know, the sub-problems are getting simpler, I'm working towards filling in the last hole. That is maybe 5% of my hacking time, if I'm lucky. The other 95%, I've written the wrong definition. I'm wondering what the right definition is. My, uh, my Emacs buffer is no longer managed by a type checker and in color. I'm back in Kansas. Uh, it's all in black and white. I'm editing text, trying to restructure my definitions to get the next attempt to work better. And there, uh, there is where... Uh, there is scope for considerable technological improvement, but it is not currently happening. And Simon, we ought to make it happen. <laughs> so, so, so. Yeah, I was going to ask a question of, uh, exactly about that. So the, it, it was a beautiful presentation, and we saw it, it was all done seamlessly. But how do you develop programs? Now, how do the 95% of us develop programs using this? Uh, Yes, so I, I have the advantage that, um, uh, that for like months at a time, I don't get near a, a, a computer as I'm teaching undergraduates. So I occasionally sketch out the next bit of the plan on the back of an envelope uh, next to my pint. And, uh, uh, and six months later, I actually know what the type of that function should have been. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so um, uh, there, there are lots of things going. There, there, there are several crucial uh, pieces of technology uh, currently missing. One is refactoring technology for failed programming attempts. And the other is the gradual design of uh, more interestingly indexed types. I mean, you saw that there were separate data type declarations in my file, one for lists, one for vectors. As if, you know, I woke up in the morning and I thought, I've had an amazing idea for a data type, lists. I've had, and then, you know, next morning, I've had another amazing idea for a data type, vectors. And I, I can say to you, 
Vectors are length indexed lists. But did I say that to Agda? Did I say, there is this thing called lists already, and we're going to make it fancier by, turning it, by imposing this extra invariant that we think we care about? That was nowhere in the code. Disaster. So it's partly that we're stuck trying to use the language designs from the functional programming of the 90s, which never had to move in these indexing dimensions or deal with any of these issues. I mean, we can't blame them for not thinking about how to manage phenomena they just didn't even encounter. But we can ask ourselves, you know, if we're just trying to make something like Haskell but with dependent types, are we really... Uh, you know, are we really making the best job of exploiting dependent types? And the answer is clearly no. There is clearly technology missing here, but there's also clearly lots of potential. Oh, can I ask one question? Sure. Can you imagine a dependent type language without Haskell's kind of purity? Something like dependent type at OCaml? Uh, I can certainly imagine a dependently typed language in which effectful programs were written in direct style. And indeed, I'm planning to build one. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, but I certainly think it is good to keep track of what the effects are. Um, so I wouldn't want uh, just as I don't want to be able, I don't want to be forced never to know. If I want to write a total program, I want to be able to be sure it's total. I want to say, this is the promise I'm making, this program's total. I similarly want to be able to say, this is the promise I'm making, this program won't do side effects. Uh, but, uh, but I don't want that to be the only deal that's available, and it's perfectly reasonable to consider uh, how to do managed side effects, including, of course, partiality. Okay, let's say thank you to the great doctor.